In this section, we're going to be taking a look at these, this idea of nations and nationalism. And this is a really difficult topic, really, because nations are these, and we're going to be talking about them as imagined communities. Uh, and they're these very malleable concepts, and they're it's a difficult concept for scholars because nations are such an important political element when we're thinking about comparative politics. And yet, they're very difficult to pin down and measure what precisely is a nation. What does it mean to have this sense of na a nationalism and what, what makes it constant from group to group? Now, we're going to say at a basic level that kind of a nation is this group that envisions itself as needing self-government. And so this means that it's inherently political. And in a basic way, uh, a nation is the institution that binds people together through a common set of political aspirations. Now, often it's going to be connected uh, to this other concept of ethnicity or, or ethnic identity, uh, but not always. Uh, it's also going to be connected, as we've been talking about, to nationalism, which is when you then take pride in your group's self-governance and this kind of feeling of nationalism. Uh, but let's start by talking about and understanding the underlying little piece here, ethnicity. And this is a, this is a big part of the piece, and we can't get at all of it. Um, but an ethnic identity is an individual's relationship to other members of society. And it's these things that bind us all together. It's a variety of institutions that overlap, uh, that largely go invisible to most people, meaning they're just such a part of their life they don't think about it, right? So their language and religion and geographic location, their customs, appearance, their common history among just a few things, uh, it gives rise to this sense of ethnic identity. Um, and so most countries around the world are not going to be um, uh, ethnically homogeneous. And that means they're going to have a variety of eth uh, ethnic groups living inside of them. And people might identify with a particular ethnic group. And it's very difficult because ethnic group is not a concept uh, that is primarily political. And neither is it easily malleable, meaning that people are largely born into a specific uh, ethnicity and there's no easy way to change that. As a matter of fact, I just said, it's not even something that we often uh, imagine uh, is something like day to day, right? You don't think about the, the, how the English language affects your connections. You don't think about why you shake somebody's hand. You don't think about why you give so much distance to another person when you're speaking to them. And lots of this has to do with these institutions that together as a bundle are going to be this, this sense of ethnic identity. Now, uh, often, but not always, out of this is going to be the concept that we're most interested in. Uh, and that is this concept of nationalism. And I warn you right here at the outset that nationalism <clears throat> is a, a difficult concept because it is going to be constructed in a very unique manner. It's both something that exists and something that is, can kind of oftentimes be created. Uh, and so if ethnic identity is the set of institutions that bind us together, then a national identity uh, is going to be those that binds us together for a common political aspiration, like we mentioned a moment ago. But what does this mean? And so there's a couple of really interesting things. Uh, 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 Setson Watson is going to argue that, thus I am driven to the conclusion that no, quote, scientific definition, in quote, of the nation can be devised. Yet the phenomena has existed and exists. And this is a, a difficult conundrum to be in as a social science scientist, because we have this concept, and I'm going to be presenting this concept to you, but it's a really difficult one um, for social scientists, and we're going to see that there's some disagreement. I'm going to try to give you the basic, okay, you know, here are the kind of things that, uh, that social scientists agree on, what is a nation, uh, but this is, not an, this is not an easy go. So what, in fact, is a nation? It is inherently a political concept. Right? It binds people together through a common set of specifically political aspirations. Um, and it drives some pretty serious 
real world political matter. So in 1947, uh, Pakistan is going to secede from India. Uh, and re different religions are going to have create some very separate ethnic identities. And over time, and due to a complex uh, political and social history, uh, Muslims who identified ethnically decided that they could rule themselves better than this other, uh, the Hindus, who are going to be the dominant force in India. And this idea that they could be a better decider for themselves of their own rules um, is the beginning of thinking about a nation, and it gives rise to the creation of the state of Pakistan. Um, Canada, uh, in Canada, the French-speaking population of Quebec have argued since the 1960s, really, that they should separate from Canada. I mean, there have been referendums on the issue in 1980, 1995, and as a matter of fact, most recently, failing just by just 1% of the vote. Uh, and so here is an another potential nation that's existing within, in both of these cases, a single state. This is something we're going to talk about more. So states oftentimes will have a singular, or I'm sorry, nations will oftentimes have a singular state in which we exist, and we're going to call that a nation state. But sometimes uh, you can have a multiplicity of nations inside of one state, and this can create some unique and difficult cleavages. Um, we're going to come... And we're going to use uh, Benedict Anderson's now really famous historic definition of a nation. He's going to argue that a nation is an imagined political community and imagined is both inherently limited and sovereign. And what he argues is that all communities, which aren't really the primordial villages where you have a constant face-to-face -face contact, must in fact be imagined, right? So you probably don't interact on a day-to-day on -day basis with somebody, say, from Washington State. Right? You don't see them regularly. But you still think of yourself as sharing something very common. You're sharing an identity of Americanness, right? And so this idea that people with which you don't have a personal relationship requires that the community be imagined in the sense that it's not taking place on a day-to-day -day reality basis and so this includes people that we never see. Now, it's limited, it's finite, um, because, even if it is elastic, because the boundaries, there are always boundaries with a nation, right? There are people that we include inside our conception of our imagined community and those who lie outside of it. So nobody ever says, ah, to be an American is to be human, right? To be American is something unique and special that separates you from being a Canadian or separates you from being British, right? It's sovereign in the concept that it wants itself to have a state and it conceives itself as being the unit which should judge and rule itself. And so central to the conception of a nation in this uh, in Anderson's framework, is community, because the nation is always conceived as of this kind of deep horizontal comradeship, right? The idea that you have connections with other people with which you do not have connections with further away people, right? So the guy in Washington is an American, uh, but the guy in Canada is not. And you don't even imagine it this way, even though you're not seeing either one of them. So if we are going to understand the nation as being the product of invention or imagination, we're confronted with the question of how a national community is actually constructed uh, in history, like how this happens. And here, it is key to understanding this, un this word myth. <clears throat> because, and we need to understand uh, the myth in its kind of original Greek meaning. And in this sense, we're not talking about something that's false. Um, we're talking about a narrative, it's a, it's a constructive vision for explaining things, that is neither necessarily true or false. It neither requires nor includes verification from outside itself. It is something that is, right? And the importance of the myth is not going to be defined by its truth value, um, but by the meaning it signifies for the author and the audience, right? So when I start talking about being American, right, it's difficult for me to say, okay, what is, what's, what's a, who's a true American and what does that mean? Well, that's not really the point of this invention. The point is this connection of community and the guidance of what it gives for the community, 
right? And so the functional important is going to lie in the role the myth plays in defining collectivities, who's in and who's out, who's us and who's them. And they're really a, they're a decisive element for the process of the exclusion and inclusion, right? This this narrative includes these it includes the person from Washington, but it excludes the person um, from Quebec. Uh, and as a result, there's going to be three common elements that arise in the literature concerning nation. Um, the first is a sense of familiarity. Uh, the second is a feeling of community. Uh, and the third, and what's really going to be kind of our defining characteristic in many ways, is a desire to be politically separate. And so what this means is, is that the national myth is this idea that I am similar to others, and it creates horizontal communities in, my, in, in these collective communities. And as a result of how unique we are from what everyone else is, we desire to be um, politically separate. Some thinkers, like Ernest uh, Riemann, are going to go so far as to define the nation as kind of the soul of the state, really a kind of a spiritual principle created out of what he call, calls a collective memory of remembrances, right? So who and what are the founding fathers? Well, we might have difficulty, you know, for those of you who haven't studied this, but you're going to have maybe an emotional connection to this and assume that the people who share that emotional connection with you are your community and you better can uh, govern yourselves than others could govern you. Um, <clears throat> one of my former professors, Dr. Adib Dewisha, is going to sum this up really well. He's going to be talking in a, in a different context, but he's going to start by trying to define this concept of the nation and what he's going to say is, quote, what distinguishes a nation from an ethnic group or any other collectivity has to be the nation's self-derived desire to achieve political sovereignty within a recognized territory. And so what he, he's getting at again is that third element, the idea that what's going to be kind of the common theme among all of our authors is, is that nationness is tied together with the desire for, to be politically separate, the desire for political sovereignty. Now, this is all well and good. But it gives rise to a really important question, and that is, how do you get to nation? How do you understand nationness? Why does it arise? And there's going to be kind of three big answers from this. Um, David Brown is going to write significantly about this one. And, and there's going to be, there's a few others, but the three main are primordialism, situationalism, and constructivism. And both, most authors are going to fall into one of these. Uh, categories. Now, primordialism is going to argue that nations are born of an instinct. It's the belief that one is born into a particular linguistic, racial, or homeland community and therefore inevitably feels an overwhelming emotional bond with that community. Um, and so, for primordialists, there's kind of two big options for this long-standing history. Option one is that these communities, these organic communities are not united by a fact of common ancestry, right? It's a sociobi sociobiology question, basically arguing that nations arise out of a biological need and community urge. <clears throat> the second is to argue uh, in the primordialist vein that the collective memory has this, there's, there's an inherent power in these cultural affinities of language and religion and custom that are long-standing, they can't easily be shifted, and they happen slowly, kind of out of the ground. And as a result of this kind of collective memory of language, religion, and custom, uh, we end up in and with the nations that we see. Now, both of these options inside of primordialism are going to be arguing that nationalism is a long-standing, not easily changed, connected to a bunch of historicity, concept, right? As we move from primordialism down, we're going to see that as situationalism and constructivism are going to argue that they're a little bit more fluid than this. <clears throat> so situationalism argues that na uh, the national identity arises due to interest. And it, it's a combination of interest for the pursuit uh, of th those interests in certain 
prevailing circumstances. And so situationalism is to look and identify some people as us and others as, quote, them. And who will occupy those categories will vary based on the situation. As a result, that's what we call it situationalism. And so ultimately, most situationalists are going to argue that it's very much an economic, rational choice kind of theory, right? We are including some in with us because it benefits what we think of as being this larger conception of us. And others are them because they don't fit in easily or we don't need what they're producing and doing. And so for situationalism then... Um, the real national groups are formed not as a result of social interactions and they gain their power from the utility and the defense and pursuit of crucial ways of life, usually economic ways of life. Now constructivism is going to be the furthest away and it's going to argue that nation is pretty much a created concept. In other words, it's all based on ideology. Uh, and so for the constructivist, nations are real substantive entities. Um, but they should be understood as a form of ideological consciousness which filters reality. And so a constructivist often says that a nation offers individuals a sense of identity and suggests that that sense of identity uh, is, connect, is, neither rash, is neither completely rational nor innately given, but rather constructed, usually unconsciously or intuitively, as a category of understanding meaning that this is an ideological decision, that we're going to be us because of this. And the decision is not like a rational choice, oh, I'm thinking about this, aha, now I'm going to be German. Um, but rather, uh, it arises as a result of these, I, this ideological identity. Now, once you have a nation, it's then possible to have what we're going to think of as nationalism. And nationalism is pride in one's people and group, and it's the belief uh, that, it, a, a group, that this nation has their own sovereign political identity, and you're pri proud of that sovereign political identity. I'm not just an American, but I wave the flag, right, kind of. Um, and this is important because it's kind of a celebration of the sovereign entity that arises here. It also oftentimes gets tied up in patriotism, which is actually a a separate, although related, topic. Um, nationalism is going to arise at an interesting uh, stage in time. It's going to emerge along with nation, or it's going to emerge along with the state. So ethnic and identity, and national identities, are actually kind of relatively recent concepts. They emerge in the 15th and 16th centuries. And they primarily emerge in Europe. Um, and for example, during the Roman Empire, right, people are not going to think of themselves as Romans in the way that we think about that today, nor did those living in the Chinese Empire necessarily imagine themselves to be, you know, Chinese. Um, the emergence of these kinds of identities instead have a lot to do with the formation of the modern state, which we've also been talking about. And so as states, as we now know, start to take form in Europe during the 15th and 16th century, um, their subjects are going to experience increased interactions. As people can travel with their own, within their own countries, uh, borders become more settled, and there's kind of this sense of security inside of the emergence of states, uh, there's an increase, this increased mobility is going to lead to increase in commerce, and as such, regional languages and tongues are going to begin to give way to a unified language. Uh, for the purposes of interaction and commerce inside of a single state. And before you know it, new social institutions are possible and become meaningful to a large portion of the state. And so growing ethnic identity, and then they're, they're out of that, growing national identity, in many ways is, is birthed through, the, the, through state. And as a result of this, you end up early on in Western Europe with the rise of what we're going to call, and I talked about it earlier in the lecture, the nation state. And a nation state is when a single nation and a single state encompass pretty much the same geographic location. As a matter of fact, most of Europe and most of European history is going to be defined uh, by the existence of this unit, the nation state. And it's going to emerge then. Now, problematically, this has not lasted, uh, not necessarily, but it is kind of a theoretic problematicness, in the sense that you now have 
more nations and which nation should become a state which can't and this is a large part of the debate in international politics and this is a large part of what we're trying to get at but for now i think we have inundated our minds enough we should have at least a brief beginning and understanding of the concept of a nation